Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or for those of you who come from the UK, good evening. Um, my presentation is going to have several forward-looking statements. Um, however, because we're not listed on any market or any exchange, if you want to invest, see me afterwards. I'll take any amount of money in a plain brown paper bag. A big plain brown paper bag, if possible. So we're a company based in Scotland, and for those of you who don't know, Scotland is actually part of the UK. Um, <laughs> and phew, that was close. Um, I better not say anything else because we're being filmed, and uh, that could be seen as a political statement. Um, we're in Scotland. We're kind of halfway between Edinburgh and Glasgow. We have um, a headquarters in Edinburgh and a, a manufacturing facility in, in Glasgow. Our lead product is a autologous uh, anti-cancer therapy with ability to treat all cancer types. Um, the technology is based around gamma delta T cells, which I'll talk a bit about. And um, we've licensed this technology um, exclusively for the UK and Europe um, from Medinet in Japan. And in Japan, um, this technology has been on the market for about the last 15 years. And they have treated many, many patients, thousands of patients, uh, with gamma delta T cells, autologous, autologous gamma delta T cells. So it's got a great history of use and some very, very compelling evidence of uh, clinical efficacy as well. It's interesting because more and more people are looking at cell therapy and putting them in context with other treatments. And if you look at the products like ipilimumab, the immune um, checkpoint blockers, um, CTLA-4, pdl one blockers, what we're doing here and what other companies are doing is very, very complementary as uh, the immune check block, checkpoint blockers are trying to screw up the tumor's ability to mess around with our immune system. We can then put these cells back in, in large numbers, and actually try to fight the cancer from two different directions. So we believe that having a clinical trial where we look at these uh, new antibody-based approaches is actually going to be quite interesting um, from a, an efficacy point of view. And so our view is to treat our first group of patients uh, at the middle of next year. And we're going to focus on um, melanoma, which means that we can uh, do combinations with products like ipilimumab. Okay, so a wee bit of science. Um, picture number one shows a, a T lymphocyte, and actually a very sexy, um, but it's really a Death Star cancer cell in blue. Um, and when, when cells are stressed, and it doesn't matter whether the stress is from transformation, um, which is caused by uh, DNA damage, et cetera, et cetera, or whether the cell is stressed as a consequence of viral infection. These stressed cells put out these things called IPPs, isopentyl pyrophosphates. And these IPPs are a really potent stimulus for uh, gamma delta T cells. And you'll see in picture two, the gamma delta T cell is kind of smelling these IPPs and has homed in on the cancer cell. And in picture three, the two fuse, um, the Gamma delta T cell produces a factor called perforin, which you don't have to be a rocket science to realize that it perforates holes in the membrane, and then it injects a toxin called granzyme in red into the cell, and both cells undergo apoptosis. It's a very simple piece, a very nice piece of biological phenomenology. So we're going to take this bio piece of biological phenomenology, take these gamma delta T cells from patients with cancer, leukopherese them first, grow these cells up in massive numbers, um, and then reinfuse them back into the body. Our first trials are going to be next year, as I said, in melanoma, followed by myeloma, and then also we're going to be moving into severe viral infections and looking at HIV and uh, potentially, quite topically, other viral infections such as uh, bird flu and maybe even the Ebola virus. We spent a lot of time over the last year or so talking to uh, UK regulators, and we had a scientific advice meeting the back end of last year and they looked at the data cohort and they decided that no additional clinical data was needed um, from a safety point of view. And they liked our approach, our stratified approach, where we take um, patients' microRNA levels. It's very well known that certain microRNAs go up and down in metastatic disease. So we're going to be looking at patients' microRNA levels in, I, I guess, as a consequence of the treatment to work out whether we need to give the patient five doses, ten doses, et cetera, et cetera, getting that real-time feedback um, and really trying to increase the potential for, for efficacy. Um, they were very happy about that. They um, believed that we had compelling evidence for a, a clinical benefit. And strangely enough, we didn't expect this. When we went in and started talking to them about how we categorized the trial, and this is a UK thing, 
they said it's adaptive. It's not a phase one, two, or three, it's adaptive. You can't do a phase one because you can't do healthy human volunteers. You can't really do a phase two because if you're getting real-time feedback on how that patient is responding, then different patients will respond to different doses. So you can't go for a dose of X because actually that might not work for everybody. So they said, look, basically, show us it's safe and then you have to go straight into an adaptive phase three, which for us was quite a surprise. And uh, it's pretty forward thinking um, from the UK regulators. And we're talking to them at the moment. We've got a protocol that's um, in draft and we're having another set of meetings with the, the MHRA to get that protocol sorted out. So I'm going to wind up with a couple of case histories. Um, Nakajima et al. in 2010 did a really neat piece of work where they treated 10 patients with progressive recurrent small cell lung cancer. Now, what's important to take, take from this study is that all of these patients were very ill. They only had one way to go. They had well-documented disease that was going to be progressing in one direction. They gave patients between 3 and 12 infusions of gamma delta T cells, and the dose... The dose doses they got were massively different, which ranged from 2.6 up to 31.4 times 10 to the 9. But what they found when they went and had a look through the data was that patients that were getting, let's say, for instance, over 25 times 10 to the 9, all went from progressive disease to stable disease, which was very interesting. Someone earlier today said dose for cell therapy is everything. And for us, that's very important. And that brings in a whole new set of regulatory challenges. When you pick up the guidelines, they say you have to keep 10% as a retained sample. I don't want to do that. I want to get every cell into those patients. So we have to play uh, an interesting game with, uh, with the, the quality team to make them become very creative at finding ways of making sure that we don't actually um, waste any of the valuable product. Second paper, which came out um, earlier this year by Wada et al., really interesting because instead of injecting the cells IV, they actually injected the gamma delta T cells straight into the tumor. And although it was a very small set of um, individuals, seven people, four of them unfortunately were lost to follow up, um, the three that were left showed an amazing results. One patient that's not, li not listed here showed um, evidence of immunological improvements, and the other two um, had clearing up of their uh, bloody acetic, acetic fluid. And uh, again, very compelling evidence that perhaps not just the dose, but the route of administration is going to be very important for different tumor types. So I'm going to finish now, talk about something I'm very proud of, the team. Uh, we've got a great in-house management team, but also we've been very lucky to actually pull in some real uh, key opinion leaders, Cancer Research UK professors, people like Jeff Evans in Glasgow and Christian Ottensmeyer in, uh, in Southampton and Ben uh, Wilcox in Birmingham, people who have lots of experience of working with cancer therapy um, in the UK at the cutting edge. Now, this picture here, you might think it's, uh, you know, just outside. This is the one day in the year that it was sunny in Glasgow. Um, actually, it's not true. It's, it's often quite nice. Uh, this is our manufacturing facility. We don't own the whole lot. We have a, a wee corner. And um, I presented at the World Stem Cell Congress in May. And uh, Chris Mason, who I've known for years, said, uh, how's your facility going? And like a fool, I said, well, we're going to build it in 12 weeks. And the first picture you see uh, up at the top there is of the manufacturing facility in May. Um, Unfortunately, Chris was right. It took longer than 12 weeks. Um, you can see how, how it unfolded. It actually took 12 weeks and two days. And you can see in the bottom right there, we're already doing um, manufacturing simulations. So we're moving very quickly. Um, we're hoping to get the MHRA back to inspect the facility before the end of the year. We hope to be treating patients the middle of next year and by the middle of 2016 be right deep and dirty in, in a phase three with a view to going towards IPO and then moving the technology over into the US. So to summarize, um, I think all I'll say is we've got a great team. Um, we're really looking forward to doing what we do best, which is treating patients. The team that we have have collectively run over 100, 120 clinical trials and treated, um, worked on 12 different cell therapies from company, going back to working with companies like um, Organogenesis, ATS and Smith and Nephew, Intercytex, PPL. Um, so we think that we understand the process of moving cell therapies from the bench to the bedside. We see ourselves as a kind of cookie cutter for cell therapy and believe that in most cases, with a good safety um, record, we can get stuff into the clinic within 12, 12 months. And that's it. Thanks for your time. <laughs>